Hey everybody, this is Linda West with Living Live, and I'm so excited today to share with you Frank Shankwitz. He is the creator and a founder of the Make-A-Wish Foundation. Now, the Make-A-Wish Foundation is a worldwide organization that does amazing work, and Frank is going to talk to us about how that came about, and the story about how it came about. We're going to talk about his life as a young boy, and we're going to talk about him now and what his future is, and also we're going to talk about his movie, his book, his speaking. We're going to talk about everything. We're going to get it all done in a half hour. So, Frank, Frank, thanks you so much, and welcome to Living Live. I'm excited to have you here. Well, Linda, thank you for inviting me. This should be fun. It, it's going to be fun, I promise, <laughs> at least for you and me. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, Frank, uh, let's, let's start with, um, first of all, let's talk about the, the founding of the Make-A-Wish Foundation. If you want to tell like, the story about how that came about, and then we'll go back to some of your childhood and other stuff. Like, let's try that way. Okay, and it's kind of a long narrative, so uh, <laughs> but, but we'll get it. I'll try and do the condensed version. Okay. Uh, in 1980, I was a uh, motorcycle, motorcycle officer with the Arizona Highway Patrol. And during this time, the TV show Chips was very popular, especially with the kids. Uh, with and the I, ladies, too, by the way. <laughs> yeah, okay. <laughs> That's right, Eric Estrada, yeah. <laughs> yes, exactly. Yeah, and uh, I was on a 10-man squad that traveled the whole state of Arizona. Two weeks oh, wow. and went down, two weeks and another. And because of the show Chips, all of a sudden the children, when we're riding into town, we were always a two-man team, just like the TV show, would start yelling, hey, Ponch, hey, John. <laughs> and I asked our commanders if we had a little bit of off time for those rural areas, we could go to the grade schools and talk to the kids about bicycle safety, which they could care less about. They just wanted to get on the motorcycles. And we knew that, but it was a great PR. And I was informed in uh, April of 1980, uh, a customs officer named Tommy Austin called one of our detectives named uh, Ron and said, I've met a little boy who has terminal leukemia. He only has a couple weeks to live. His heroes are Ponch and John from Chips. And he told his mother, when I grow up, I want to be a motorcycle officer, just like Ponch and John. And the customs officer said, is there any way he can meet one of the motorcycle officers from your department, from the highway patrol? And, and Ron had known that I had been doing this all around the state with the children and called me and said, will you get involved with this? Well, of course, I, I'd be happy to. Yeah. And the uh, department arranged for, with the doctor's permission, Chris's mother's permission, for our state police helicopter to go to his hospital, pick him up, fly him to our headquarters building, where I would be standing by with the motorcycle. And I had no idea what to expect. I, I had not met this little boy. I just expected our paramedics to help him out. He's gonna be on IVs. Uh, the helicopter landed and out the doors open, out jumps this little pair of red sneakers just running over to me. <laughs> Hi, I'm Chris, can I get on your motorcycle? Oh my gosh. Of course you can, Chris. And he had watched Chip so much and our equipment was identical to California Highway Patrol. In fact, we did our initial training with CHP. The only thing different was our, our on our uniforms. The patches were different, and that's it. Okay. And he got on the motorcycle. He said, okay, this switch is a siren. This, he knew what ship so much. He knew every switch and button on that motorcycle. And he was he how old at that time? He was seven years old. Okay, okay. Yeah. And and uh, he, asked, he even asked if I'd open the saddlebag to see if I had the same stuff that Punch <laughs> Eric Estrada had in there. Did you? Oh, of course, of course. This little boy was just having so much fun. And it dawned on me that, that he's laughing, and this little boy just come off IVs. And I'm mm -hmm. looking at his mother, and she's got tears running down her eyes. And it dawned on me, she's watching her seven-year-old boy again, playing, having fun, instead of laying in a hospital bed. It just yeah. got to me and the other officers. And a funny part of this morning was I said, we were allowed in those days to give the children a ride in the parking lot on our motorcycle. Mm -hmm. And I said, Chris, would you like to go for a ride on a motorcycle? He got very nervous and no, voice shaking a little bit. Really? And I said, well, okay, Chris, now you just flew in a helicopter. How come you don't want to go on a motorcycle? And he looked at me very seriously and said, helicopters have doors. <laughs> <laughs> and we learned that doors were very important to him, even though he wanted to be a motorcycle officer. <laughs> so just about then, one of the uh, squad cars pulled up, and I said, you want to help drive the squad car? And he said yes, and he jumped on the sergeant's lap and helped steer the squad car around mm -hmm. the parking lot, red lights and siren. But the funny part of this was, as he was doing this, he was chewing bubble gum, and he blew this giant bubble. Mm -hmm. And 
I looked over at his mother and I said, there's his bubblegum trooper, which she <sighs> wrote a book about to, with that title, which I believe is still available on Amazon. Bubblegum Trooper, I love Bubble it. Bubblegum Trooper. Okay. But just to kind of condense this, Chris became the first and only honorary Highway Patrol officer in the history of the Highway Patrol that day, complete with his own certificate, his own badge, which was assigned to him and still assigned to him today, 37 years later. Oh, wow. Uh, got to meet the director of the Highway Patrol, got to meet the director of the Arizona Department of Public Safety. And his doctor who was with him, told his mother, you can take him home tonight, take him to his comfort zone. He said, I don't understand, but his vitals are so good. Mm. Take him home. And Chris got home to go home that night, but we felt good about what we we're doing. And one of the officers said, we have a new highway patrolman. He needs a uniform. Uh -huh. And uniforms are custom made in that in those days at a, a tailor shop in the Phoenix area. Uh, just to closing, we went to the shop. We said, we've got the seven year old boy. He's about this high, this wide. Um, can you make a uniform for him? Two ladies spent all night making mm. a uniform for Chris. Mm -hmm. The next morning, we picked up the uniform. We had got permission to go to Chris's house in the rural Phoenix area. I led several motor other motorcycle officers, squad cars in his neighborhood, red, red lights and siren. You can imagine the neighbors, right, about yeah. hey, what's going on. Chris came running out, and just in awe, we handed him his uniform. He couldn't believe it. He runs in gets changed immediately, comes strutting out with the uniform, <laughs> just proud as can be. But he comes over to me and he says, my wish, and that's the first time I heard that word, is mm -hmm. to be a motorcycle officer. How do I do that? Mm -hmm. He was happy being a, a highway patrol, but he wants to be a highway patrol motorcycle officer. Okay. John. And I just teasing him and I told him, it's a shame we don't, I told him the course that we go through the training. I said, it's a shame we don't, uh, you don't have a motorcycle. We put up some pylons right in your driveway and test you. Mm -hmm. Chris was a step ahead of me. He runs in the house and comes out right in a little battery-operated motorcycle okay. that his mother had got for him and placed in a wheelchair. He's got on his uh. uniform. He's got on the helmet we gave him. He's even got on the aviator glasses that his mother had got for him. Oh, my gosh. But the funniest part, Linda, was he put on what we call on a ranch a, a rubber mucking boots, the high-top boots with his pants stuck in that looked like our motorcycle boots. Uh -huh. Very serious, we set up the course, he goes through, he comes back, did I pass? Yes, Chris, you did, you passed. When do I get my wings? Mm -hmm. I'm referring to the motorcycle wings that we wore in our uniform. And those were special ordered also. And I said, Chris, I'll get the wings right away. It'll take a day or two. Okay. Chris, I got to stay home that day, just happy as can be. Yeah. <clears throat> I ordered the wings a couple of days later, just as I picked up the wings from the jeweler. I get a call from the dispatcher. Chris is in a hospital, in a coma, probably not gonna survive the day. Mm -hmm. I received permission to go to his hospital. When I entered the room, his uniform is hanging right by his bed. He's in the coma. I pinned on the motorcycle wings on his uniform. Just as I did, Chris came out of the coma. Oh, he wow. looks at me with a big smile. Am I a motorcycle officer? Now, yes, you are, Chris. His wish had become true. Unfortunately, he passed away a couple hours later, and I always like to think maybe those wings helped carry him to heaven. Yeah, wow. Well, our, our commander said, we have lost the fellow officer, because he was sworn in as an honorary high patrol officer. And we learned his funeral was going to be in Illinois, a little town called Kewanee, Illinois. And my commander's asked if I would go back along with another motorcycle officer to give Chris a full police funeral, which mm -hmm. we did. When we got to Kwan, Illinois, the word had got out. Our, our Fraternal Order of Police had contacted the Illinois chapter for Fraternal Order of Police. And when we got to the funeral home, we were met by Illinois State Police, County Police, City Police to give this little boy a full funeral possession. He was buried in uniform as Chris Marker, Chris Marker reads, Chris Gracious, Arizona Trooper. Mm -hmm. But coming home, Flying home, I just started thinking, maybe somewhere over Kansas at 36,000 feet, <laughs> there's a little boy who had a wish, and we made it happen. Why can't we do that for other children? And that's when the idea was foundation was born. Wow. So would you say that that was the aha moment, that, like, that, was, that was that moment where you were like, we need to do something different, we're going to start a nonprofit? Or at that point, was it not even going into a nonprofit yet? Well, it was, it was thought it was going to be the nonprofit. I don't know if that was an aha moment, mm -hmm. but I just had that idea. And I'm a, I'm a police officer. I don't know anything about nonprofit. <laughs> right. I took a lot of time studying at 
uh, the local library. This is before the days of internet and everything. Yeah. Not to start a nonprofit. And then also, um, by Arizona Corporation Commission rules for a nonprofit, you have to have a total of five board members. Okay. And finding the other four members who believed in the idea was a chore. It took six months. Wow, six months? Six months, because everybody that was involved with the initial, let's call it a wish of Chris, mm -hmm. they just I contacted him, this is my idea, it will never work. It, it's just too far-fetched, nobody's gonna accept the idea. And going back to my childhood a little bit, I was taught, I always turn that negative into a positive. Okay. So you know, find a way to make it, yes. And I kept applying that and found, finally found those four other people that believed in the mission. And uh, off we went, we got our 501c3. Well, what would you say that kept you going? Because six months of hitting um, no, there was, there was something inside you that for some reason you felt like you needed to do this. What was well, that? I, I had researched with St. Joseph's Hospital, which then was the Children's Hospital in Phoenix area, and found out there were several uh, terminally ill children in that hospital. Mm -hmm. And I kept, I said, these are the kids that we want to get to. These are the kids. And we started out with ages two and a half to uh, 18. But these are these kids that they need that wish before they pass away. They need, and the family also. They need to get together yeah. in the family unit. Just have so much fun. Forget about doctors and, and hospitals and everything else and bills. And that was the drive to keep it going. Yeah, wow. Well, thank you so much for doing that because um, you could have given up, but you didn't. You persevered, just kept going forward. And, boy, what it is today. Do you know how many wishes have been granted to date? Well, this, this is a, I recently got this figure, and this just kind of blows me away, if you don't mind that expression. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> make a wish is worldwide. Right. And there are um, 63 chapters in the United States. There are 36 international chapters on five continents. And last month I got a new figure that we have granted since 1981 when we became official, mm -hmm. 415,000 wishes around the world. Wow. How does that make you feel? Very proud, very proud of also what, what the whole team has done. Mm -hmm. um, obviously, I was first president and CEO, but it took a lot of help over the years. But, uh, and the other good figure is every 28 minutes, and this is the one that really gets to me, every 28 minutes somewhere in the world, a wish is granted. All because, wow. all because of one little boy who wanted to be a motorcycle officer. Yeah, oh my gosh, 28 minutes. Yeah. Wow, that is just, it is mind, it's, it's mind blowing. It's hard to comprehend, yeah, it's hard to comprehend. It really is, because we hear about statistics all the time, and, but to think, first of all, that there's that many kids that are having wishes in the first place is, is mind blowing in itself, but then you guys are granting those wishes. So that's absolutely amazing. I love it. I love it. So and, now and I also want to point out when we started the foundation, it was for terminal illnesses because leukemia in those in the early eighties was a death mm, sentence. Exactly. And now through the grace of God, modern medicine, more and more children are surviving. In fact, there's about right now a 70% survival rate. Yeah. So about 15 years ago, we changed the mission statement to children with life-threatening illnesses. Oh, okay. Hopefully, hopefully through, I'll say, through the grace of God, modern medicine, they're going to go in remission. And this unofficial figure is about 70% of these children that get their wishes do go in remission. Wow. So and it just shows the power, the power of the positivity and what they're getting that wish granted is so crucial to their life, right? So that Oh, and yeah, yeah. Life, and yeah. We have what we call a rush wish where the doctor will say, if you're going to do this, it has to be done in a month or two because the child is not going to survive. Oh, the child gosh. goes on the wish, whatever it might be, at Disney or meeting a celebrity, whatever it might be, mm -hmm. and comes back and goes into remission. <sighs> Total remission. And the doctors can't explain it. And we just call it the power of a wish. And in my mind, and I've got to talk to a lot of these children afterwards who are now adults, and they just said, I had so much fun. And I want to do something like that again. Oh, wow. Oh, my gosh. The only way I can do that is get rid of whatever's happening to me, the cancers and so on. And wow. Life. Yeah. That really does show the power of the mind, right? Like, exactly. Exactly. That is amazing because I, I know I had heard about some uh, younger, you know, people that their wishes granted, but they're alive today. And I was like, how is that possible? Because I thought it was always terminal. So that's good. Um, good to know you guys. 
you had to change your mission statement because unfortunately a lot of kids were surviving their cancer. Yes, yeah. Yeah, so that's a great thing. I love and it. Even, and even in our original charter that we wrote, um, hopefully we'll go out of business someday. Wouldn't that be neat? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Exactly, like, like all the nonprofits that are doing cancer research, you know, hopefully someday they're, it will be gone and they won't have be necessary. They can have a different cause, you know. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> That'd be awesome. So I had a, a friend of mine ask me this question. She was wondering about um, making wishes come true for terminal illness adults. Yeah, there, there are several organizations in the United States, and I, I can only think of the one name now in the Arizona area. It's called the Bucket List Foundation. Um, and they do the wishes. It's just like for the kids, but for adults. And generally, it ends up with the senior adults that are later in their 50s, 60s, 70s. Mm -hmm. Anybody over uh, 21 or over. But if anybody, well, there's several in California. And just Google adult wishes or okay. adult wish foundations, and it will bring up a whole list. Uh, there's three or four very credible ones in the California area. Okay. Well, that's great information. I love it. And then now let's uh, talk a little bit about uh, you have the book, The Wish Man, and then you have The Wish Man movie, which is here we are right now, the end of 2017, and The Wish Man movie should come out sometime, hopefully in 2018 is what we're looking at? Yeah, 2018, it's, uh, we completed uh, filming the end of October, and everything was filmed up in northern Arizona here. My hometown is Prescott, mm -hmm. and uh, filmed predominantly up here. Um, it's now in editing, and the editing process is not just the editing of the film itself, but then we add in the sound, the color, background music, and that. Uh, they're hoping for a release in the Toronto Film Festival in September of 2018. Oh, wow. Yeah. So it's not just editing that, but then it has to find the distributors. You can make all the movies you want. Right. But, uh, <laughs> Well, they've got to finish that editing process and get it to distributors and to see. And it's a full-length motion picture. It's not a, a documentary or a, a Hallmark type thing. Okay. Yeah. And okay. And then um, in the making of the movie, you were there the entire time because it was in your hometown, right? You were there during the making of the movie. Yeah, I was hired as the uh, consulting producer and also the technical advisor. Uh, it sounds like fun, but it's not. <laughs> Is it boring? <laughs> Long days. Now, the poor crew, they started at 4.30 in the morning. And oh, they wow. About 7.30, 8.30 at night. Mine was I had to be there at 7 in the morning every day. Mm -hmm. And I usually finished about 8.30 at night. Oh, wow. That's still, that's a long but, day. Uh, I felt so good because the director, the set designers and that uh, came to me asking for ideas. Is this right? The uniform's right? The background right? Because this is a period piece, Linda, from 1950 to 1980. Okay. So had to recreate these signs and sets looking like the 50s, looking like 1980, finding cars, motorcycles, clothes, everything to fit um, that period. Good times, good times. <laughs> yeah, yeah the, the, the crew was just fantastic. And Theo Davies is a director, and he also wrote the original screenplay and just did a fan, fantastic job on that. I'm so excited to see it. I can't wait. I hope it does. It gets all wrapped up and everything, and the bows put on it. You know, in time for that festival, and then we get to see it. I was, I was so excited. Yeah, and I think one of the producers and social producers is a young lady named Linda. Who? <gasps> Linda West. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Thank you. <laughs> That's right. Oh, I love. I'm. I'm excited to be part of it. You know, it's just yeah. a. Uh, your your whole story is just really um, intriguing to me and you know to many people you know listening and watching because of what you did is is you had an idea and then you kept going with it and you got your board of directors you fulfilled the obligations that you had to do and then you guys all turned this into something humongous did you ever in your wildest dreams imagine that it would be this big yes I did after we granted our first official wish which was a young boy going to uh, Disneyland in California. Mm -hmm. And the response we got, the televisions from all over the United States now followed that. Oh, why don't, why don't you tell everybody how you got that wish? Because there is some little like thing you had to do that was a little bit different in order to get in the door. Little seven-year-old again, seven-year-old nicknamed Bopsy, Frank Bopsy Salazar, um, again, terminal leukemia. Uh, his wish was to go to Disneyland. Mm -hmm. He also wanted to be a fireman. He also wanted to be a uh, ride in a hot air balloon. And we only grant one wish. But uh, being a 
president and CEO, I told our board we're going to grant all three wishes because we're going to get so much press on this. People mm -hmm. are going to learn who we are. And he did. Phoenix Fire Department made him the full turnout suit. Just had a blast doing that. A friend of mine had a hot, hot air balloon. This uh -huh. is a story. I mean, Disney had never heard of us, and I kept calling it Disney. This is who we are, the Make-A-Wish Foundation. All I'm asking for is maybe free admission. Can he get in the front of the line because he's in a wheelchair, very ill? And they didn't know who we were. People contact Disney all the time on things like that. Yeah. And they just kept, no, no they kept hanging up on me. Finally, I just kind of said, oh, well, and I called and I said, I need to talk to your director of public relations. Who is this? Like they always answer. Mm -hmm. said, this is Officer Frank Shankwitz, Arizona Highway Patrol. And they said, what's this about? And I said, I have a warrant for one of your people. Uh -huh. Well, I got the person I needed to talk to right away. Right. But immediately when he got on the phone, I said, now, I just lied. Here's my name. Here's my badge number. Here's my supervisor's name. All you have to do is call and get, and I will be fired immediately. But please listen to my story. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> yeah. And now, 37 years later, Disney being the, one of the biggest sponsors of Make Wish, literally millions and millions over the years. And I think that was my aha moment, as you say. Yeah, that's, that's so awesome. I love how you, you know, took your, took your uh, authority. And used it for good, you know, in that way. It was a little lying, yes. little white lie, but. Um, well, yeah, some, sometimes you have to lie a little bit to qualify that lie immediately. <laughs> well, yeah, and that's a good point because so the first thing you said was, you know, I, you know, I, I said that to get here, you know, here's my information. If you want to get me fired, you can. And, but you just went into it uh, real and honest, which is very important, you know. Right, right. Yeah. So let's talk a little bit about your, uh, your upbringing as far as, I know you were kind of back and forth a little bit when you were growing up, but there was one man in your life that really put you on, on a path, Juan. Juan, Juan Delgadillo, yes. And um, I was kidnapped by my, my mother, divorced my father when I was like two years old. Mm -hmm. uh, she kidnapped me off a playground when I was five and said we're going to Arizona. I had no idea who she was. Oh, and, wow. uh, she took a strange route to Arizona. But we lived in Michigan for several years. We lived in a tent. We lived in the back of the car. We lived in flop houses. Just she'd work from one job to the other. Finally, at age ten, uh, we did get to Arizona, a little town called Seligman, Arizona, on Old Route 66. Now nobody knows where Seligman, Arizona is, but if anybody saw the Disney animated movie Cars, mm -hmm. Radiator Springs in that movie is Seligman, Arizona. Oh, That's cool. what they based the movie on, where how the interstate bypassed the town and the town died. But uh, that rancher took us in, and we lived on his kitchen floor. That was our home for almost uh -huh. six months. Uh, uh -huh. My mother slept on the couch. I had a bedroll on. But I got a job at 10 years old uh, washing dishes full time. And I noticed a man across the street from the restaurant. He was starting to build something. I had no idea what. Um, I went over there and just said, hi, I'm Frank. What are you doing? He said, I'm Juan. Grab a hammer. <laughs> and I had no idea. I had no father figure to show me all this stuff. Mm -hmm. And Juan did become my father figure. He built what is called a snow cap, which is like a Dairy Queen, which now 37 years later is iconic. The tour buses from Las Vegas go just to Sligman just to go see this little snow cap. Are you whole kidding? <laughs> but, um, and he, he just taught me so much. Like I said, he was my father figure, my mentor. And one of the biggest things, uh, I used to work part-time there. I was mopping and cleaning and that. And he said, Frank, when you can, give back. Mm -hmm. I said, what are you talking about? Well, we don't have a thing. We're still sleeping on the kitchen floor over there. He said, you don't understand. He said, you don't have to have money to give back. Right. He said, people in the town are helping you and your mother. It was predominantly Mexican in the Indian uh, population in Seligman. He said, they're bringing you uh, beans and tortillas to help, to help you guys eat. And everybody just kind of helping you out. Sligma was about 500 people population. Okay. And he said, you can give back like Mrs. Sanchez. She's always bringing you food. But look at her yard. She's a widow. It's full of weeds. It needs painting. The porch needs painting. You're old enough. You're big enough. You can do that, which I did. And he said, look at Mr. Ortega. They got one of the old Rick booses off the Santa Fe line, got it into town, and that was going to be the family home. And again, you can help paint. You can help clean up around there. And I, exactly. And I learned from Juan, you don't have to have money to give back. You can give yeah. back on your time. And I've always remembered that. I'm, I'm 
senior years now and I still anytime I can give back but the other thing too is when I was in started seventh grade my mother said um, <clears throat> I can't afford you anymore I'm moving and uh, you're gonna stay here in town with somebody uh -huh. that, that would devastate I guess most kids and it did me initially and I went over to talk to Juan I said what am I gonna do mm -hmm. and he said the first thing you need to do is learn to turn that negative to the positive okay that's the first time I heard that. Again, this is 1950s. That wasn't a popular term like it is now. Exactly. Like yeah. that. I said, what do you mean, Juan? How, how can I do that? My, my home just left. And uh, he said, we're going to make arrangements for you to live with Mrs. Sanchez, the widow Sanchez. She's going to charge you $20 a week room and board. You make $26 a week. For the first time, you're going to have $6 a week of your own money. Because mm -hmm. everything I'd ever made went straight to my mother. I didn't get an allowance or anything. And okay. Said, but the positive part is you're going to have for the first time your own bedroom. You're going to have indoor plumbing, your own shower, because we had to go to the Santa Fe station to shower and that. And uh, not only that, but uh, Mrs. Sanchez is the best cook in town. You don't have to worry about meals. Anymore. <laughs> and it turned out I, I lived with her for two years and it turned out he was correct. He was correct. And the other big plus was Mrs. Sanchez got the first and only television in Seligman. Oh, so, oh, really? <laughs> yeah, so that, that was a big plus, too. I could start watching the Mickey Mouse Club. <laughs> <laughs> that was in what year, then? Was that? That was uh, 1954, 1954, 1955. So before that, everybody would lay on the floor and listen to the radio, right, and stare up at the radio? <laughs> well, yeah, when they could get reception. Uh, they couldn't get oh, reception. <laughs> okay. Time, except for the Navajo Hour off the Navajo Reservation. And we could understand that because there was, I, uh, 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 so. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> you didn't speak yeah. the Navajo language. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's a fantastic story. I mean, you're just, it's, it's been an interesting journey for you, for sure. And turning that negative into the positive, there's been many situations where you've had to do that. And you've done a great job of it. Your book, um, The Wish Fan, what inspired you to write the book? Uh, I was contacted by a, uh, another mentor of mine in my senior years named Greg Reed. Uh -huh. and he suggested he had heard all my adventures, and especially the one where, and I don't talk about it too much, well, I did in the book, about where I was killed in the line of duty and brought back to life. Oh, that's right. I wanted to bring that up because you have gone through a near-death experience yourself or an actual death experience, so you want to talk about that. Well, yeah, and we're, we're kind of getting off track, but we'll get yeah. back. <laughs> but, yeah, again, on that 10-man squad um, traveling all over the state, and uh, we were in Parker, Arizona, which is on the uh, California-Arizona border, <clears throat> border by the Colorado River. And during the spring break, college spring break, the little town of Parker from 500 goes to almost 50,000 people up and down the river. And they bring in all the motorcycle officers, too, and uh, car officers, too, because then it was all the drugs, sex, rock and roll type thing, mm. people getting killed constantly. I was in pursuit of a drunk driver, 25 miles on, going 80 miles an hour. Um, another drunk driver pulled right in front of me, no time to react, and hit him broadside at 80 miles an hour. Uh, I was told this crash was spectacular. Uh, but, you're uh, like, mm-hmm. <laughs> and was pronounced dead at the scene. My partner could not bring me back to life. Uh, he called in what's called 963A officer killed in the line of duty. An off-duty emergency room nurse from California stopped mm -hmm. and said, please let me work on him. They said, no, there's no... She said she didn't ignore him, thank God. Wow. And the next four minutes, performed CPR, heart massage, and brought me back to life. <clears throat> and there's a funny story to that, but I won't go into that. But okay. it was during that period of recovery because it took about six months to recover from that accident. Mm -hmm. and, uh, skull fracture, traumatic brain injury, all sorts of brokenness and that. And I just thought, why did God spare me? Yeah. Because every, every police officer I've ever worked with is, believes in a higher being. And... Uh, so why did God spare it? There's got to be a reason. And I found out that reason in 1980 when I was introduced to Chris, the seven-year-old boy. Yeah. Oh, my gosh. Just beautiful story that, you know, you came out of it. So thank goodness she was there. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. It, because the area you were in is not, it's not like highly populated. It's not like a, in Los Angeles. Well, or anything. yeah. <laughs> there, there's, no, there's no hospitals anywhere near yeah. the hospital. The hospital is 150 miles away. And uh, <clears throat> they had a little clinic with they put me in for a couple of days. And. Um, then back to the motel room because I couldn't travel. And we had a traveling mm -hmm. secretary at the time that would go with our squad. Okay. Uh, all the reports, and her name was Kitty. Uh-huh. 
Carlisle, and Kitty kind of took care of me because there were no nurses or anything. And that started a relationship where three years later we got married and uh, <laughs> you're still married now <laughs> 34 35 years later yeah but sometimes she said i wish i would have let you uh, go into shock but <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh that's so funny okay so uh, let's see what's what's next for you you got the movie and when the movie comes out are you are you speaking in a lot of areas you know parts of the world Where, what's going on with frank now well, I started mentioning Greg Reed uh, about the book, and uh, he encouraged me to write the book and uh, help me with the publishing on that. But that book led to all of a sudden speaking engagements. And mm -hmm. I, was, I was a speaker, and through his mentorship, um, just started getting more and more speaker engagements. And a couple of years ago, I'm going to boast a little bit because I'm proud of it, was named the Forbes number one keynote speaker in the nation. Wow. Which is, yeah, thank you. That's awesome. Which has led to all sorts of speaking engagements. Um, and this latest little uh, medical setback I've had, I've been, the last couple of months I've had a cup back. Mm -hmm. You come on an airplane two or three times a month going somewhere. Oh, wow. And I've got a uh, manager uh, named Stephanie Rakey, and uh, she lives in Iowa, but she's booking now, and she's got me booked for almost 2018 now. Fantastic. Oh, I'm yeah. excited to and hope y'all be able to it. I enjoy it so much because during the meet and greets, no matter where I'm at, if it's an audience of 50 to like at Ohio State University, I gave the commencement address and uh, mm -hmm. with 19,000 people. Wow. Usually it's two to two and a half hours of meeting and greet following with majority of the people saying, I'm the mother, father, brother, sister, aunt, uncle, grandparent of a wish child. But wow. the biggest thing, and Linda, the biggest joy to me is they, an adult will come up and say, I'm a wish child. Oh, gosh. And, and that is just so much fun to meet them. And they could be in their late 20s now, and I'll say, what was your wish? And I will look at their eyes, and mm -hmm. you can see them reliving, reliving that whole wish experience. <clears throat> that, that, that's my payback. That's my payback. Man, that got me tears big time because just thinking about it. And I, and I never it. mentioned it. Uh, my time with Make Wish, I never took a salary because I wanted oh. to go into the foundation. And people said, well, that's noble. Why did you do that? I said, I have a job. I'm a police officer. Right. I had a full-time job, which I enjoyed doing. And real quick, I want to go into that. After about three years, I could not handle both. I couldn't be a police officer full-time and try and run a foundation. Mm -hmm. so we made The board made the very wise decision of hiring the people that were experts in the nonprofit world. Okay. And, and that's what made the foundation grow. We've uh, had probably about 10 president and CEOs from our national office over the years. And the current one, David Williams, who's been there about 11 years now, has really made the foundation grow to the worldwide it is today. And that was a very smart decision by our board. Let's hire the professionals. You have to pay those professionals. Right. Well, that's that's interesting because you guys were not nobody on the board was um, salaried at that time until you decided to turn it over to the professionals that could make something bigger out of it. Not make exactly. something out of it because there was already something of it, but to make it a, a so much bigger cause and helping so many more people. Right. Yeah, and we had the name, we had the brand, we had the credibility, mm -hmm. and and the character on it. And I always like to say the accountability. But um, we didn't have the Rolodexes like these professional yeah. had. In the, and then when we first started hiring, one of my questions was, what's the size of your Rolodex? Oh, yeah. And one gentleman out of the group was saying, he said, well, I, need, I have two Rolodexes I need to go through, which means he has a lot of contacts. Right. <laughs> and that's what we need, the contacts. Yeah, exactly. Oh, my gosh. Well, this is an amazing story, and you know, I look forward to seeing what you do in the future. And I know that whatever you do, it's going to be absolutely amazing because you just you have such a big heart. And I don't know if you remember the first time I talked to you. Is I do. <laughs> I, so you want, to, you want to hear how I tell the story? Go ahead. <laughs> okay, so you spoke at Secret Knock. And this was about two years ago, two or two and a half years ago. You spoke at Secret Knock, and I just like... I was crying when you were speaking. It was so moving. And then you went down and you sat at your table after you were done speaking. So I ran over to you to get a picture. Then I went back at my, to my table. And then um, the day ended. The next day comes. And I'm driving there. And I'm like, I'm going to walk right up to Frank Shankwitz. And I'm going to say, Frank, you are going to be the keynote speaker at my event. And, and then when I got to the venue, though, I couldn't find you anywhere. 
So I was like, <laughs> and I was like, oh, I missed my opportunity, missed opportunity, right? Like I kept on thinking, missed opportunity. And um, he left, like he didn't come today. But so we took a break and I, I was like, I had blinders on, I'm looking for Frank and I found you, like you were clear on the other side of the room. So I beelined it straight over to you and you were in what I call the circle of death. It was you and three other really tall guys because you're over six foot tall, right? Yes. Yeah, and like all you guys were over six foot. I'm only five foot three, so I'm like this midget, you know. <laughs> but I just stood next to you and I stared at you just like this, very nice and quiet, polite-ish, and I just stared at you. And then you looked down at me and you said, "Oh hi, can I help you?" And I said, "Frank, you're going to be the keynote speaker at my nonprofit event." <laughs> and you're like, um, "Excuse me, gentlemen, I'll be right back. I'm going to go talk to this young lady." And then we stepped aside and talked, and and it just was for me. It was one of the biggest moments in my life because I had always been scared to approach people that I saw, you know, as, as um, like just, I, I put you on a pedestal, you know, honestly. And so I saw that and I, I, I put myself through that situation, which was very scary for me, was because I had this desire of what I wanted so strong that I wasn't going to let anything get in my way. <laughs> <laughs> And when you mentioned and one of the things Greg Reed taught me during mentoring is he said, you're going to become a celebrity. I said, no, I'm not. I'm just a cop. I'm still still a homicide detective at the time. Uh -huh. And he said, you're going to become a celebrity. But remember, you're just like everybody else. And and, and don't, don't ever think that you need to be put on a pedestal. And right. I always remember that because people will try and treat me like a celebrity now. But, and I appreciate that. But I, I, want, to, I want to talk to them, too. Yeah, exactly. And that's, that's what's so amazing because you're, you're just so kind, so humble. And, you know, for what you have done for the world, it's, it's just absolutely incredible. And I'm just honored that, you know, to know you. It's, it's been a very a good experience for me, too, because that's what I'm saying. <laughs> well, thank you. And I, I like to say I had an idea and I made it work, being in the foundation. <laughs> but it's taken all sorts of people over the years to make it grow, to make it better. It's just a whole team effort. Yeah, definitely. It takes a team. So with all of that said, you guys, you know, check it out. The Wishman, the book, the movie's coming out. And really, really looking forward to sharing Frank Shankwitz and his story of, you know, the founding of the Make-A-Wish Foundation. And um, I look forward to seeing you again. Hopefully I'll see you in March. In March, yes. 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 Okay, it's fantastic. Yep. Yeah. So if you're I'm wondering what we're talking about, reach out to me and I'll tell you. <laughs> <laughs> secret, secret knock in March. I'm going to see Frank, and it's uh, going to be an amazing event. So, Frank, again, thank you so much. I really appreciate it, and you have a wonderful, wonderful day. And, Linda, thank you for inviting me, and a Merry Christmas to you. Thank you.